All right, so the last article on sexual harassment that we're going to look at is uh, Offices and Gentlemen uh, by Jonathan Rausch. And um, he gives credit to uh, Eugene Volokh, uh, who he'll mention at the end of the, toward the end of the article. Now, what Rausch does is he looks at several, I think there's 19 different case studies uh, that he's concerned about as far as sexual harassment in the workplace. I'm not going to go over all 19 of these. Um, you, you've read them in your um, uh, course pack as you went through his article. Uh, but we can, we can talk um, briefly about whether the Unitarian in a charismatic workplace is a case of harassment. So as you read, uh, the Unitarian um, would go to work and his workers, uh, who were charismatic, um, would gather around him in the morning and pray around him and encourage him to convert. Is that sexual harassment? Should people, should the government step in a, into the workplace and prevent people from trying to convince another employee to join their religion? Is that the government government's business? Speech is protected outside of the workplace, but not inside it? Isn't this their right? Don't they have the right to express their religious views to someone else? Doesn't it violate the right to free speech to prevent them from expressing their religious views? You can look at uh, what's labeled page 52 uh, in the course pack. That, that number may be off depending on, on what number you're looking at in the course pack. Um, is certain types of art in the workplace sexual harassment? David's Michelangelo, or uh, Michelangelo's David. Um, is that sexual harassment? A nude figure of David? Um, the painting that he describes uh, in your course pack, is that actually sexual harassment? What about the case of Paula Jones? Um, if you're not familiar with uh, the Clinton case, and Paula Jones, uh, make sure that you read that in the course pack. The grad student who had a picture of his own wife on his desk was required to remove it because it was considered sexual harassment. There was a famous Goya painting in a lecture hall. It was removed because of sexual harassment. and so on. Like I said, there's there's 19 of these. And all you you should be familiar with these, but I don't I don't want to do these. Uh, that last one is interesting. Should a business have Bible verses? Should the government step in and say that you can't have uh, Bible verses um, on your checks? Between 1989 and 1993, 90 5% of sexual harassment filings were for a hostile work environment, not for direct sexual harassment, but for creating a work environment that was determined to be offensive. The complaint. Rauch's position is that this is the most virulent threat to free speech. He argues that we have mistaken discriminatory speech for discrimination. So your talking may be discriminatory, even though your actions may not be. Should we take away your speech, your right to say things that are discriminatory? If I were to say that women are better than men, that's discriminatory speech. If I were to fire a person because he was a man, 
that would be an action of discrimination. And Rauch's, Rauch's point is that we have mistaken those two things. They are distinct things, he says. They are morally distinct things, he says. And again, uh, make sure that you're familiar with the um, case study number 12, the white correction uh, offices um, with the cartoons and the vandalism. Is the discriminatory speech the cause of discrimination? Should it be stopped? He asks. Title VII says nothing about speech, but he's concerned because as it has grown through lawsuits, it now requires employers to prevent speech that is severe or pervasive enough to create a hostile or abusive work environment based on minority status for the plaintiff and for a reasonable person. Now, because employers do not want to be taken to court, he says, they are overreacting. In other words, they're limiting, um, they're, they're creating rules in the workplace that shouldn't be there, according to Rausch. Now, someone might respond to Rausch and say, now, wait a minute, as an employee, you're a captive audience, and so the employee should be protected from the speech around them. Now, what's a captive audience? Well, a captive audience is a legal term um, that works something like this. I'm in my home. Someone comes to the sidewalk outside of my home and starts preaching at me. I don't have an escape. This is my home. This is where I live. I have no other place to go. In that situation, I am a captive audience. They do not have a right to stand outside my window and shout at me. The courts will protect me. Roush is asking, is that the same in the workplace? Do you have that same protection? Are you a captive audience if someone does that to you? When you go to work, they stand outside your your cubicle, they stand outside of your office, they stand on the sidewalk, and they yell at you as you're going in to work. Are you a captive audience in that situation? Roush points out, no, the Supreme Court has decided that only the home is where there can be a captive audience. But even then, there aren't free speech restrictions inside the home. If I want to teach my son a certain point of view, he's not a captive audience. And Roush further points out, so the Supreme Court has said, well, it only applies to the home. Um, Roush further points out that we simply can't avoid being offended. There is offensive speech in life. People are going to hold views that offend you. People are going to say things that offend you. Someone might suggest the workplace should be treated differently. But Rausch responds to this that everywhere is someone's workplace. So if the workplace is to be be treated differently, then everywhere you go has to limit free speech. That's his concern. You go to a park, someone works there. You go to a restaurant, someone works there. You go to a place of worship, someone works there. You walk down a sidewalk or a street, that's someone's work site. The waitress refused to serve someone who is a, a customer who is sitting in a, at a table reading Playboy. Should she have been protected? Should she be forced to serve that person?
A FedEx worker was harassed every time that she brought a package to a certain person, and he harassed her. He, he ordered packages specifically to harass her. Should she have been rewarded by the courts as she was? A U of M student was kicked out of class because he argued that homosexuality was a treatable disease. Should he have been kicked out of class for holding that view? This goes to the idea of words that wound. Rausch argues if there is no distinction made between words and actions, then the government has to act against talk that is speech that is discriminatory. In, the, in a, a well-known case, uh, Davis versus a Monsanto uh, chemical company, um, it, said, it said this, by informing people that the expression of racist or sexist attitudes in public is unacceptable. People may eventually learn that such views are undesirable in private as well. So if we teach it in public, it may reach down to private lives. Is that a good argument? Is it true? And is it moral? Roush wants to know. The men working sign. Sexist. It should say people working. The state had to pay a lot of money to fix those signs, if you look at that case study. Now, don't confuse what Rausch is saying. Offensive speech is offensive. He is not condoning or saying that it's a, an okay or morally permissible thing to do. What he's asking is, should the government step in and say, you cannot engage in that speech? How do you handle offensive speech against the right to speak, the freedom of speech? Is ending discrimination more important than free speech? Well, if that were the case, if the government were to just tell you what you can say and what you can't say, then Rausch says, we simply don't have free speech anymore. Point two. Maybe we should just ignore this conflict. The court should ignore the conflict. So ending the speech or dictating the speech ends free speech. That's a bad solution, number one. S second solution is that we should just ignore this conflict uh, between discriminatory speech and discriminatory action. Well, he's concerned again that employers are constantly overreacting and they're worried about what's being said uh, in the workplace. They're concerned about getting sued. So here comes uh, Volokh. Uh, so remember, he's, um, this article is based on um, uh, some things that Volokh wrote. And this is one of the things that Volokh wrote. Hostile environment harassment occurs only when, he says, discriminatory speech is targeted at an individual in one-on-one -on -one conversation, when the individual has objected, and when the speech is pervasive. In other words, the individual can't get away from it. So uh, this is similar to what we saw with Wall in the first ar article, um, leaving out uh, overheard conversations, group uh, conversations and postings uh, that Fury uh, was concerned about. 
Well, here's Rausch's concern. Why should one individual end up controlling another individual? One individual standards holds for the entire company? And again, going back to the idea that then this would apply across the board because everyone's place is someone's workplace. So all of a sudden, this limit on speech applies everywhere you go. Rausch's response to this is no. The First Amendment is good enough for the workplace. And he says this, quid pro quos, discriminatory actions, threatening someone, being obscene, and slandering someone are not protected by the First Amendment. These have, you have never been allowed to do these things. So if the First Amendment is good for you, it's good enough for the workplace. And here's the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to a petition the government for a redress of wrongs. And he concludes, and um, again, um, if you haven't read this, you should read this. It's His ending is interesting in this article. Um, we cannot be afraid of other humans.